This is Sarah Guido, and not only is she going to give you an amazing talk about clustering, she got her degree this morning, her master's from Ann Arbor in information sciences. And she's about to give you a really amazing talk on, I'm going to guess, maybe two hours of sleep. Like that. <laughs> so, without any further ado. All right, so um, this is the repo, or it's not up here, it's up there, but it's not up here. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, so this is the repo for the materials for this talk. Um, it's actually going to be more of a talk instead of a tutorial because there were so many things I wanted to tell you about, I wasn't sure how to pack them into 40 minute, in a, in a 40 minute tutorial, but if you really want to follow along, um, there's an IPython notebook in this with basically like all the code that I talk about today. It's very messy and it's not very awesome, but I will make it awesome later. Um, so clone at your own risk. All right, so I want to talk to you about k-means clustering with scikit-learn because I think right now that's probably my favorite machine learning algorithm. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, like Cindy just said, I graduated from the University of Michigan today, which is, which is great. So glad to be done. Um, in a couple of weeks, I will be joining a startup in New York City called Reanomy as a data scientist. And um, I, I like to be really involved with the Python community. Um, I created the Ann Arbor PyLadies chapter. And um, if you're on Twitter, I'm also on Twitter and I love Twitter, so tweet at me. It's my Twitter handle, Sarah underscore Guido. Okay, so um, I'm going to just today I'm going to get really in depth with what the k-means clustering algorithm is, um, how it works, when you should use it, and then I'll show you um, a very basic implementation of it, and then implementing it um, with some tuned parameters, and then we'll we'll compare those results um, just to just see uh, the how how good the different uh, tunings are. Um, I do want to mention that. Uh, my talk assumes that you have at least a somewhat basic knowledge of machine learning. Hopefully you attended Porsche's talk prior, prior to this one, um, so you know what's going on with that. Um, I don't really explain basic concepts too much, so um, yeah, just to let you know. Um, so just to review, uh, clustering is a form of unsupervised data, or I'm sorry, unsupervised machine learning, and um, it's useful for when your data is unlabeled and you don't know what you're looking for. Um, the way that clustering works is it splits observations into groups so that observations in the same group are more similar to each other than they are to those in other groups. Um, and this is done by some sort of distance metric, um, like the Euclidean metric or the Manhattan distance metric. Um, and clustering is, is really useful for exploring your, da your data, especially if you don't know what you're looking for. And there are, there are many different kinds of, of clustering algorithms, and there are actually a lot of variations on the k-means clustering algorithm, but I'm just going to talk about that one today. So um, k-means clustering formally is a method of vector quantization, and um, it, it partici partitions the space into Voronoi cells, and um, it basically separates samples into n groups of equal variance. And this works uh, by dividing up a set of points where each group is represented by its centroid point, um, which in k-means clustering are the k initial clusters you choose. So you choose um, the initial clusters for the clustering algorithm. And uh, it uses the Euclidean distance metric. And it also works to, within these clusters, uh, minimize the within cluster sum of squares. So the way that this works um, is basically a process of iterative refinement. There are three basic steps. The first step uh, is you choose your, your k clusters. You choose however many cl initial clusters you want to start with. And then it iterates over um, the next two steps, which are assignment and update. The as in the assignment step, observations are assigned to the clusters they're most similar to. And then in the update step, uh, the cluster center is recalculated to the mean of the new cluster based on the assignment. Um, so the cluster center will move. Um, and, and then it reassigns the observations again to the clusters that they're most similar to, and then recalculates the cluster center. It'll move again. It basically does this over and over again until um, convergence has been reached, meaning that the, point, the, the observations no longer move around and the cluster centers no, no longer move around. So this is what this looks like. So um, the top right there, uh, the top left and right, that's the assignment step. Um, you have your observations, and you initially assign them to starting clusters. Here we have a red, a blue, and a green cluster. 
And then in the update step, um, on, the, on the bottom left there, you can see uh, the cluster center is basically recalculated, and then the observations are reassigned on the bottom right there. So we have three red points instead of two red points. We have five green points and so on. Um, and this, this will go on, in, again, until convergence, convergence has been reached. So um, k-means clustering has, um, is, is pretty good for um, large amounts of data. It scales pretty well. Uh, it's, it's efficient because you are choosing the clusters, and it will always converge. Um, so its benefits are also sometimes its disadvantages. So um, if you choose the wrong k, things can maybe not make so much sense, as we'll see later. And um, the, it, it usually converges to the local minimum, which um, is, is locally with it, like near the cluster, the minimum value, but, but may not be the global minimum. So it may not be the minimum value in the data set, which can be good or bad depending on what you're trying to do. So um, k-means clustering is good for normally distributed data. Uh, Non-normally distributed data can really skew the results um, because we're using a Euclidean distance metric. Um, it's all, it's, and you also want to use it when you have a large number of samples and also not too many clusters, um, which sort of is to your own interpretation what too many clusters is, but um, generally works better for fewer numbers of clusters. And it's, it's also more efficient, which is, um, which is why you choose K. Um, and uh, it's, it's also good for when um, your data can be measured in a, in a linear fashion. So um, non-normally, or um, non, uh, data that can't be separated uh, in a linear fashion may require another method like a kernel trick or something like that. Uh, so before we jump into demonstrating this, let me say a few words about scikit-learn. So scikit-learn, um, hopefully you of that talk previous to this one, is my machine learning module of choice. Um, it's, a, it's an open source project that's constantly in development. There, there's a lot of community support for it, which is really cool. It's built on top of NumPy and SciPy, so you can use it in conjunction with those modules, um, which I will also do in a bit. Um, it has a lot of built-in data sets that you can mess around with for um, seeing how the different algorithms work. It's very comprehensive of the different algorithms, and there are a lot of tutorials and resources out there for actually learning scikit-learn. So this is just the basic fitting a model process um, in some pseudocode here. So we set a model equal to an estimator object. It's going to be our, our k-means algorithm. And then in unsupervised learning, you fit that model to your data, and you just, uh, you, your, your data is your data set. Um, in supervised learning, you would use the labels as, a, as another parameter for like classification, but um, not, not in uh, k-means clustering. So in scikit-learn, k-means is efficient and fast. Um, you pick the number of clusters to start with, and uh, the algorithm finds those initial centroids. And um, a really cool thing you can do is you can run clustering jobs in parallel, which I haven't done too much with, but it for, for large-scale data, it looks like it would be pretty good. Um, so before I, I show you this on, on my data set, let me say a few words about that data set. So um, I took this data set from the University of California Irvine Machine Learning Repository website. Um, it's a really great website with a lot of different data sets. Um, they have, uh, oh, I don't know, a lot. And um, they, it, they tell you uh, what machine learning tasks they're good for, like regression or um, clustering. So the one that I chose um, for today, because it looked kind of fun, was the individual household power consumption data set, um, which basically uh, records household power cons consumption. And um, the data set has about 2 million instances. I'm not using all of them because um, it was, it was uh, making certain things run really slowly for the purposes of, of creating this. But um, so some of the different, the different features in this data set, uh, global active power, um, which is household global minute averaged active power in kilowatts, global reactive power, which is household global minute averaged reactive power in kilowatts, um, voltage, which is minute average volta voltage in volts, global intensity, um, household global minute average current intensity, and then um, submetering 
one is kitchen, two is laundry room, and three is water heater, air conditioner. And what these things really mean, I don't know, because I don't know anything about power consumption. So, so uh, let's just explore our data set. Um, so let's just first throw this data into a k-means estimator with the defaults and see what happens. Um, so we create our k-means object, k-means equals k-means, and then we fit it to our values. So let's see what this does. So uh, a few notes. Um, I ran some pr uh, principal component analysis on this to, uh, to get it down into two dimensions so I could better visualize it. Um, this is what we get, though. So the white X's are the centers, are the center clusters of those uh, initial eight centroids, um, and eight is the the default um, number of clusters you get when you just pass in a data set to the estimator. And this is great, um, kind of interesting, kind of looks useful, but maybe we can do better. So let's talk about tuning some of the parameters of this algorithm. Um, it has eight different parameters that you can turn, you can tune. Um, so uh, n clusters is basically choosing k, the, the number of clusters you want to choose. Um, max iterations, the, the maximum number of iteration, iterations it will go through those uh, assign, assignment and update steps in a single run. Um, let's see. Uh, the n jobs parameter is the, um, when you can, uh, you can say if you want to run it in parallel or not. Um, so I'm actually not going to talk about all of these because uh, it, would be, it would be a lot. So I'm going to um, talk about n clusters and how to choose k, and also the init parameter, um, which is basically um, how you choose uh, to assign those clusters. So let's start with uh, the number of clusters. So as you might have guessed, um, choosing k is the most important part of k-means clustering because if you if you do it wrong, your results aren't going to mean much. Um, there are there are different methods. There are a lot of different methods for doing this um, in machine learning. There are usually a lot of different methods for doing a lot of different things, and it's impossible to talk about all of them in forty minutes. Um, so uh, three interesting ones. Um, you can graph the, uh, the percentage of variance explained against different values of k. And at some point, um, adding more, more values or higher values of k will stop significantly explaining the variance. Um, you can use an information criterion, and uh, this will determine um, the goodness of fit for your estimator. You can also use cross validation, um, which, much like uh, using cross validation to test how accurate your model is, you can use it to test different values of k. Um, I'm going to focus on that first one, though, graphing the variance, because I think it's really interesting. So unfortunately, there is no built-in function in scikit-learn to graph the variance. So um, you kind of have to make up your own. So we can use um, scipy and numpy to figure it out. Uh, I'm not going to um, explain every single piece of the code that I wrote here. I'm just going to give you the general overview of what I wrote. So um, we, we need two. Uh, Two functions from SciPy, uh, the cdist function, which uh, is the di distance computation between different sets of, of observations, and then the pdist, which is the pairwise distance computation between observations in the same set. So we get these. Um, first, uh, we want to determine what values of k we want to test. So since eight. Uh, since choosing uh, eight initial clusters looked pretty good earlier, um, I'm going to just test up to choosing 14 uh, clusters. So we set that. Um, then um, using a list comprehension, I fit the uh, k-means model for each of those clusters, so from 1 to 14, well, 13 actually. Um, and then uh, I pull out the cluster centers for each model. Um, the the k-means estimator object comes with different attributes, and one of them is the cluster centers attribute, so you can pull that out. So that's that last line there. Um, then uh, we're almost done. We calculate the Euclidean distance from each point to each cluster center. Um, we get the total within cluster sum of squares. We get the total sum of squares, and then we get the between cluster sum of squares. And if we graph that, we get this. 
So um, this is a pretty typical graphing the variance graph here. Um, you can see at, uh, adding clusters at first dramatically accounts for the variance, but it plateaus later on. So let's take a look at um, a few of these values. So um, let's look at four, just because I think that would be interesting to look at. It's kind of near the beginning. Um, let's also look at seven, since, since eight was pretty good. So seven may or may not be better. So four is not so good. Four, so this is, this is why choosing K is very important, because um, choosing four clusters doesn't really represent anything mean, meaningful there. Um, it's just kind of white X's in the middle of sort of nothing. Um, seven looks a little better. Um, a little better. Let's look at eight again, though. So eight might be better. Um, it's hard to say at this point. So let's move on to the other parameter I wanted to talk about, and then we'll come back to this. We'll actually combine all of them and do some fun, fun uh, scoring stuff. OK, so um, the init parameter is pretty straightforward. Um, the default is k means plus plus, which uh, selects initial cluster centers for the clustering in a way that speeds up convergence. Um, you can also uh, pass in random, and that'll choose um, the, the number k observations um, at random from, from your data set for the initial centroids, which sounds interesting, but also might go terribly wrong. Um, and then you can also pass in an ND array. So um, you can basically assign manually cluster centers. I'm going to look at the first two, though. So. Um, so let's try running k-means with uh, n clusters set to both 7 and then 8, and then also setting it to both uh, k-means plus plus and then random. We're going to try all the combinations, and we're going to see what happens. So on the left there, that's just our default. That's what we started with. Looks pretty good. Um, you know, not, not too exciting. On the right there, though, um, that's uh, we still have 8 clusters, but we're setting the init to random, so we're selecting random random observations from our data set as our initial cluster centers. And that doesn't look that doesn't look quite right. Um, that, that big brown section on the bottom seems seems a little too spread out. Um, and uh, let's see, if you could see there um, in the top left hand corner, um, there are two white X's that are really close together. So that's probably not a very good uh, indicator there. So if we move on to choosing seven clusters, um, the the left one there is um, what we what we did before. It's it looks pretty good. Um, on the right though, that's again uh, using random for the init parameter. Um, and again, we have uh, in the in the top left corner there we have two x's that are really close. So maybe not so great. So you've. Uh, You've done all these tests. You have all these models, um, and they, you know, they look. Some of them look good. Some of them don't. Um, we can actually test them uh, by comparing their silhouette scores. So um, you you would use this metric when um, you don't have the ground truth, meaning you don't have anything to, to compare it to, and that's sort of the uh, the thing with clustering and, and unsupervised learning. Um, you don't really have labels, so you have to be able to test it um, without knowing what, really what to compare it to. Um, so um, this works by computing uh, the mean distance between an observation and all other points in, in, in its cluster, and then also the mean distance between an observation and all other points in the next nearest cluster. So um, it does this for each observation and uh, assigns it a score between negative one and one. And the closer it is to one, um, the better fit that that cluster is for that particular observation. So um, in scikit-learn, um, the silhouette score function computes this and then takes the, the mean of all of, of the silhouette coefficient for all of the observations. And again, closer to one, the better the fit. Um, this scoring method takes a really long time to run. It's not very efficient. Um, I think uh, I had about, I think I have 20,000 instances. Uh, I took 20,000 instances out of the, the much larger data set. 
And it took a good like five minutes to run, um, but it is useful. So here are our scores. Um, you can see for eight clusters with uh, k means plus plus as in it, we get um, we get a pretty good score. We get a you know a 0 0.81 there. Um, eight clusters with our our random. Uh, selection of initial cluster centers is not very good at all. In fact, that's the it's probably the it is it is the worst one of the bunch. Um, seven clusters uh, with with K-means plus plus is okay. Um, again, uh, seven clusters with random though not so good. So in this case, the default wins. So what does this tell us though? Um, tells us that patterns exist, uh, which is really useful, especially if you don't know what's going on. Um, and also groups of similar observations exist. So there's something going on where within our data set, um, things are similar to each other, which can be really useful. Um, sometimes the defaults work. Sometimes they don't. It really just depends on the data that you're working with. And finally, we need more exploration. Um, there are other parameters. There are um, other, other methods of choosing K. Um, so few tips. Uh, clustering is a good way to explore the data. Um, not to, not, it's not a way to absolutely say this is what's going on, but it's a good way to get in there and see, okay, here are interesting things that I want to investigate next. Um, it's always good to remember that intuition fails in high dimensions. So um, especially uh, if you have very high dimensions, so um, using something like dimensionality reduction can really help that. And especially um, being able to visualize what's going on is, is really helpful. Um, and you can use this uh, in combination with other models. Um, you could run this sort of algorithm, determine, OK, I have eight separate groups. I'm going to label these as eight separate groups and then turn it into a classification algorithm or something like that. Um, and then also knowing your data is really important. So knowing what's going on, um, you'll be able to make the, the best judgments about um, what parameters to tune and what algorithms to use. So um, there's a lot of great materials out there. Uh, the scikit-learn documentation is really good. Um, highly recommend it. There are tutorials on there. Um, there are uh, a lot of resources for machine learning data sets out there. Um, there's the, as I mentioned before, the University of California Irvine uh, Machine Learning Repository website, which is that first link there in the data sets section. Um, really great, very comprehensive. Um, and also mldata.org is, is pretty good. There's some overlap, but um, there, there's also some unique stuff. And then I um, found this really cool blog the other day that, that uh, walked through some of this stuff, um, Data Science Lab. So yeah, check it out. And finally, um, contact me. I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on GitHub. Hopefully uh, I will be able to make the materials for today a little less um, messy and more thorough. And then, uh, yeah, you can learn about this all you want. So that's all I have for you. Um, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> Oh, good. We have a mic for the questions. When you did the dimensionality reduction, uh, was that also sort of helping your intuition that there were clusters there? Because if you tried PCA to only two dimensions and it was just noise, it would you wouldn't see clusters? Hmm. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think um, doing that sort of thing is also a very important first step in sort of seeing what's going on. Um, and, and yeah, reducing the noise. So I would say yes, definitely. So you had mentioned that um, k-means clustering is really designed with the assumption that your data is normally distributed. What kinds of transformations do you do when it's not? Hmm. Well, um, if it's not normally distributed, I would probably use something different. So I, there's um, uh, 
You can actually combine kernel tricks with k-means clustering. Um, so sort of like how SVM, you're able to nonlinearly separate uh, vector spaces. Um, you could use, um, you, could, you can combine kernel tricks with k-means clustering. I haven't done too much of that, but um, that, that would be a thing you could do. Um, yeah, uh, come talk to me. We can, we can find more fun things. <laughs> nice catch. Thanks. So uh, with, with I think I think really high dimensional data, you know, you want to visualize the clusters, but two PCA vectors might not be enough to really get the whole sense of the data. Have you ever found, what, what do you do in those kind of cases where, you know, two, P, two vectors may only explain 30%, so you don't really want to base your decisions visually or whatnot? Right. Um, so... I really only did that for the purposes of this talk. If I were really doing it, um, I would really, you know, I would really try and figure out what the best, uh, you know, what the best number of components is. And um, uh, visualization is not my strongest suit. <laughs> so um, in terms of visualizing it, I'm not sure. But um, if I, you know, if I was doing this in a real life situation, I wouldn't just, you know, willy nilly pick two. I would, I would, you know, do feature extraction and, you know, really figure out what would be the best number of components. So, yeah. I guess that's not a great answer, but it's all I got. Oh. Any other questions? This is your chance. That's a great question. Um, My question was, can we download the slides somewhere? I will put them on SlideShare immediately. And then um, I will tweet the link, so incentive to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> and all of these are being recorded, so they're going to be accessible to people. Oh, there we go. Anybody else? OK, can we all thank Sarah for staying awake long enough to talk to <laughs> So we are done a little bit early. Um, I think there's something else after this, and I can't remember what it is. Uh, there are drinks in the city. So if you are not aware, you should have been sent an email that tells you that uh, Zipifen, if I'm saying that wrong, I apologize, uh, is sponsoring a meetup up in San Francisco. You do need to go back to that email and register. You do have to have an Eventbrite ticket to get into that. Um, and otherwise, we are having another event here on the campus tomorrow after all of the sessions. Um, so that's going to be here. And why don't you guys start wrapping up, and we'll start getting you guys escorted to the next place you need to go. Thanks.